Delish, Trish. <laughs> Trish. So you're Trish? <laughs> yeah, I guess I am sometimes. Everything must be shortened. All things. Even even your lifespan. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I'm not overworked, underpaid. Underappreciated. Uh, under yeah. All of the I'm above. okay if you, it's like, yeah, I I'm okay if you die sooner by working harder. It's great. Benefits me in the short term. I heard a little beep there. What was that sound? I don't beep. know. I heard no beep. Well, like a like a beep. notification or something. Beep on you. Which is weird because I have yeah, I have like a oh. the do not disturb on. I don't know what's up. Oh, it's LinkedIn. Look at you, LinkedIn. Go to hell. What are they telling you? Let me find out. Post notification. Post somebody the messaging. Hey, Evan. It was really hey. nice to meet you on LinkedIn. Would you like to have... Your podcasting could sound better. Can I help you with uh, your reach on social media? Yeah. I offer these services. I get those as well. Are you hiring? So I got to say, so writing an ASI right now, trying to get it out. And what is that? Additional services, something? No. Um, archit what is it? Real. Such a, mm -hmm. such a bad architect removed. you are. I've been uh, removed. <laughs> <laughs> Architects supplemental instructions. It is a mechanism to, to issue changes during construction administration that could or could not have a financial impact on the project. It's just, we're saying, hey, this needs to be changed. Here is, here is the information that it will supersede the dot, you know, the current documents that you have. And then you'll let us know whether or not this is a proposed change order or mm -hmm. there's a no cost revision. So it's a modification to the design of yes. something that hasn't been built yet yes. and therefore was not bid was yeah like so so right. it's or in this late, particular late. case i was telling you know this was a a lab building that we were doing we did the lab building based off of not having any users because at the time oh, yeah. this was okay. this was kind of it went out it went out onto the streets with no users yeah. COVID, all of that other stuff, you know, now that we're emerging from all of that, you know, now we're the, the university or actually the hospital in this particular case is bringing the university on in all the different users. Now they're trying to fit out this lab building with their specific needs. And so all so of it's these client driven change, it's not like something are, that you yeah, found as exactly. some exactly. omission of the documents that then needed to be updated. It's like, okay, so everybody right. understands like. These changes are probably going to cost more money, but it's being oh, yeah. initiated yeah. by the by the owner side. But yeah. this is just like the way you document all that. Okay. It, it will absolutely, it's absolutely one hundred percent owner driven, and it was always expected. It it honestly was always ex it wasn't something that we went into this saying, oh, I mean, we just you know, really gotta. We knew we basically labeled it as a generic lab building, knowing that down the road. And so as we're designing this future lab building, we wanted to make sure that we're designing with enough future flexibility that whatever they throw at it, we would be able to accommodate. Now there was a lot of limitations because this is you know, both yeah. a, an, an existing building and an addition it's not to a blank an existing slate. building. It is not a right. blank slate. And so yeah. You know, there are some limitations that we have to put on them. There's like, hey, we want all of this. And we're like, hey, you can do almost all of this. And they're yeah, like, well, yeah. why can't we do all of this? And, and, and you know, there's the back and forth of this. It's like, well, this is the way we work. It's just like, 
well, this is the way the building will allow you to work because this yeah. is all we've got out of it. Other people like, made those decisions before you. Kind of exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's just like, hey, we expect to be doing this and our current space is fit out. Let's just say like a laser lab that it's fit out with all sorts of different um, vibration mitigation mm -hmm. systems. Mm -hmm. And if we didn't design to that, especially as the higher you go up in a building, especially like this mid-rise building that we're doing, there are certain limitations that you can and can't do. You know, there are some ways of mitigating vibration at the piece of equipment, you know, right. but if the building can't assist in it, then it's all the piece of equipment that has to do it. And then you ask yourself, okay, is this acceptable? You know, like the... PI, the principal investigator, they, they say, okay, you know, if the building's not going to help, you know, this is how much it's going to cost me to spring isolators and, you know, dampers and all this other stuff to this piece of equipment. Could you do yeah. like a raised floor, uh, like a fully dampened raised floor that, that would just, In, I, I'm, so, I'm just thinking of like, have you seen GoPros technology? Like the way that they can, they can stabilize motion on a camera on, when I'm riding my mountain bike down the rockiest trail ever. And like, mm -hmm. The footage is rock solid and it's in this little tiny box that sits on my chest or on my helmet. Yeah. It seems like we could apply that technology to a space in architecture and have full three axis isolation from, from, and stabilization from any, any movement possible. Okay. Yeah, it. Moving on. Make, make it happen. <laughs> make it happen. It, it, you know, uh, if GoPro can do it, you if, can do it. <laughs> But see, they're only trying to stabilize images. They're not trying to stabilize things down to the atomic level, or the subatomic yeah. level. Oh, um, well. And I so, mean, I guess if you want to introduce that constraint, fine. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, the interesting thing about it is, is just like there, there are things that we've done. We've done, you know, fully separated, isolated slabs that have basically like a dampening system within the slab as stage one of multiple stages to get it down to such the micronic, I don't know, we're going to make up a word. You know, moronic, like, micronic level. The, the, <laughs> the, the most minuscule moronic level possible uh -huh. to basically make it where nothing moves, nothing shakes, nothing. That sounds cheap. Yeah. And then when you're <laughs> doing that on a building that's existing, yeah. And say, for instance, you're like, well, you know, can't you just do a mm. raised isolated floor? It would be great if we had that kind of flexibility because, yes, that could be a possibility if we didn't have basically 12 foot floor to floor, you know, heights already. We have constraints, you know, a minimum constraint of, um, which we call it the, uh, minimum constraints on the actual equipment, you know, like equipment that they're wheeling through on carts and everything yeah, else. Getting that, it in there. Yeah. That's a minimum right. of eight foot six. And so nothing can hang lower than eight foot six. So they just can't move through their site, you know, through their mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. and, and then, and so you just like, you add all of these constraints together. And the question really is, okay, what can and can't we actually do in the space? You know, it's going to make it functional. And then we go through this whole assessment of everything. And then we basically tell them, yes, you can do your work the way that you normally do your work. No, you can't. Here are some of those constraints. Let them know whether or not, then they tell us if those constraints are acceptable for them to proceed with doing these changes. And if it's not, then they basically say, okay, well, we're out of this, you know. Sounds somebody. like a contract for a new building at that point. <laughs> right. It's, it's. It's funny because they're basically saying, and, and they weren't at the table early enough, right, during the, when all the decisions were being made, but they're saying like, look, this is what we need to do our job. And you're saying, right. well, because of this constraint and this constraint and this constraint and the yeah. decisions that were made before that, you can't. And, yes. and they're like, all, all we need is the tools to do our job. And you're saying, this isn't the space for you. So. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, <unfor> that is the unfortunate news that sometimes we have to deliver. It's like, well, you know, this isn't the space that is going to accommodate how you, you know, do this. And mm. we don't have to break that news to the actual PI. You know, we okay. have to break the news to the client to then break it to the PI. So, so that, yeah, but they will definitely throw you under the bus. <laughs> you are, are the bad guy. <laughs> Always. Yeah, like, why, oh. why can't we do this? This is like, 
the the most current requests are we would like to have break rooms within you know our labs and we've already you know buildings already been built a lot of like plumbing and everything has already been run everything's already a vending done. machine like, in there come on well i mean you know vending machine yeah <laughs> I, I'd, I'd say yes if if that is the limit of your break room then yes we can do that but a sink a dishwasher all of these other things with all of, you know associated plumbing and everything else when oh yeah by the way where you want to put it is immediately over an electrical room guess what <laughs> guess what you can't do i don't i don't see a problem here well, that's the thing that is, you know, what's funny is that that is the thing that a lot of people don't see is they don't see the problem. Like, why is that yeah. a problem? It's just like, well, you know, code is, is, you know, and then you look at their lab and of course they don't really care about code because they, you look at the way that they're working now and you're like, oh, um, yeah, I'm going to just pretend I don't see this because yeah. these are violations yeah, right. and, you know, and all of this other stuff. But you're just like, wow. It becomes the challenge of education to somebody who's more more focused on literally more focused on the subatomic level than of like this big macro view of like why can't the building accommodate what I do? You yeah. know, it's just a building, it's just four walls, it's a it's a roof, it's a floor, you know. Why can't it do that? And you're just like, Well, you know, it's the building is not as dumb as you think it is. <laughs> Well, and you as the architect are zooming in and zooming out and zooming yeah. in and zooming out, and they're just yeah. zoomed in <laughs> the, all the time. Exactly. Is what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. They're, they're hyper-focused, and with good reason, they're hyper-focused on what they do. They don't do yeah. what we do, which is goes back to you know the conversation we always have about the value that architects bring to the table. It's mm -hmm. like when owners are communicating with users and the users are saying, I have all of this wish list. And then the owner comes back to the architect. The architect says, okay, this is what we can and can't accommodate. And then, you know, it's this back and forth of like trying to hone in on what they can use. Yeah. That's, that's the thing that people, you know, constantly need to see as the value of an architect. Yeah. Well, and the, the architect also needs to be able to communicate that story to them yes. effectively. Absolutely. And that doesn't, <laughs> not all architects can do that. Well, let's like, be honest. Right? Sometimes like, a lot of the times, like the user groups can't really be troubled with like, I can't have all of these meetings. I've got classes, I've got research, I've got this, I've got that to do. And, and I get it. I, I get that, you know, their time is limited, but it goes to a sort of like devaluation of our time. Cause it's just like, I just told you what I want. Just give it to me. And they yeah, don't understand yeah. the, the, the transaction has got to be a back and forth. We've got to, we would like to explain to you why you can't do this because we would like to understand what you do and don't need so that we can make sure that we can give you what you want. And if we don't really truly understand, or you don't truly understand the limitations of what, you know, what we're facing, neither one of us will ever come to a consensus. We'll just, they'll, that's where that. Communication comes in, right? And and, exactly. and it is a negotiation, right? There, it There is. is a negotiation phase here. Yes. It's not just, here's my laundry list of wants, make it happen. It's like, okay, now let's talk about all of the constraints mm -hmm. that are right. affecting right. this space, the project, the site, what the, you know, there's so many different things pulling on different ropes in different directions in this tug of war. Exactly. It's not just this way or that way it's it's radial and this is a radial plan <laughs> it, it is it is and uh, radial tug of war yeah and so that's when you have got to make sure that you have full buy-in from like say the owner in this particular case there are so many different facets of people involved the multi-headed client the uh, multi-headed group exactly yeah, right. and it's just like the people who actually need to be at the table are the user groups because they're the ones who are going to be day, to, day by day there. But, you know, there's nuances of things and this just, you know. Uh, well, and there's that administration layer that adds mm -hmm. the extra yeah. complexity, but also the guardrails for the user group, right? Exa because exactly. somebody has to be the decider, right? And right, typically right. that's going to be that administration layer who uh, probably won't be there when the building actually opens anyway, <laughs> to add another layer of complexity. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, uh, yeah. And, and then 
you know, not to get too deep into this, but it's just like making sure that we don't start working on something that doesn't have full user buy-in because mm -hmm. a lot of times people don't understand. It's like, well, you know, okay, yeah, I did change my mind, but what, to, what matter does that make? It's just, it's just changing a little bit of, you know, a little bit of stuff on that piece of paper, right? Mm -hmm. Not understanding that there's recalculations, reassessments, all of these other things. Does the equipment that you now want to move in there add a greater load, heat load for mechanical, a demand load for electrical, you know, and all of these other things, you know, oh, by the way, that needs a drain. Well, guess what? We can't put in a drain that in ripples. here because, you know, it's just ripples like down. all of these little oh, things that people think are just that little, like, you know, oh, it's just a little, yeah. little symbol on the piece of paper. How hard is that? <laughs> mm -hmm. And then wonder why it takes us, like, why can't you just turn this around tomorrow? You know, why mm -hmm. can't you, well, we asked for this, you know, why, why does it take you so long to, to do what it is that we're asking you to do? And they, again, they don't see the nuances of fully vetting, fully assessing things to make sure again, that it works. Cause then at the end of the day, if like, say they, you know, want to move in a mighty minus 80 freezer, but we can't accommodate it. Then we have to go back and tell them, by the way, you can't move in this, you know, minus eight, minus 80 freezer. And then they're like, okay, well then if I can't have that freezer, I, I can't really work here. No, again, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's those little simple things. Balancing all of that, being the bearer of bad news, yeah. uh, the, the, the coordination, the complexity behind the scenes. I think all this leads to <laughs> what we were really going to talk about here. Exactly. I was, I was definitely going to say that so because the, because people ask us for things and they ask us for quick turnarounds, you know, essentially expect us somewhat demand us to like you know, give them a, you know, an expedient answer. It mm -hmm. causes us to, and, and I'm going to give you an example of, of something that I heard in a meeting that we had with, you know, a client that I'm not going to talk about, but just, but still just hint, you know, this is where we're leading into this conversation. It's like, mm -hmm. we need, we, we have all of these demands of all of this stuff that we need. We need the schedule. We need a work, work plan. We need all of this stuff. And by the way, we expect that it'll be in our inbox by you know, Sunday morning when we come to work. Sounds Sunday reasonable. Sunday morning when they come to work. So, Sunday morning. <laughs> so, you know, here we are getting this request. Oh and goodness. now, you know, now this request is forcing us to overwork. And there's the word. And there's the word. Because you had sent me, I think actually even on the day that I was having this conversation or we were having this conversation about Oh, these demands about getting stuff, you had sent me an Serendipity. article. Serendipity. Yeah. And you, you, you must have felt or heard that little cosmic <laughs> that The connection. universe is yes. conspiring. It's just like, <laughs> like, did somebody just ask Cormac to overwork? Let me send this. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so what is the title yeah. of the article that we're going to talk so, about? And so what, what you had sent me was from the Harvard Business Review. And it was why we glorify overwork and refuse to rest. And it's just let's just ha hang on that pregnant <laughs> pause right there. <laughs> just really? soak it in. Yeah, soak just in. just let that let that marinate for a moment. Why right? we glorify overwork and refuse to rest? It. There you go. I'll meditate on that. Exactly. Uh, I, I'm I'm letting out a heavy sigh here too because I mean and I think you said that this is probably more of an American thing than I mean it's it's definitely all over but it's also yeah. it is kind of an American thing right because we 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 get two weeks of vacation every year right we get yeah. two whole weeks compare that to other nations out there who right. take sabbaticals they take uh, six weeks off in the summertime the Eight. office closed down every friday in the summer like for it there's paid sick leave that lots of different examples yeah pay, paid paid sick leave that. that does well i was gonna say paid sick leave that doesn't affect their actual vacation time because you know that's mm. not one in the same you know whereas what we're doing is we've got you know paid time off which is either a you can get sick for those two weeks 
or you can mm-hmm. go and like rest and relax for those two weeks. And it's like you choose however you want to not be here at work. Here's what we're allowing you to. We allow you to be sick this much or take off this much or whatever this much. And you say, oh, you have to leave for a couple of hours to spend time with your family or whatever. Okay, well, those two hours, don't charge them to a project. Don't charge them to a client. You charge that to your time off because that is you choosing to not be here. And Okay, but at the same time, but at the same time, Cormac. Okay, PTO actually stands for personal time off, right? Or private time off. I've even heard people say, it's like, uh, you don't need to know what I'm doing when I put those hours down. They, none of your business. I, it could be like you just said, it could be sick time. It could be a doctor's visit. It could be, uh, uh, you could be visiting the office of the principal because your kid got in trouble. Uh, you could, you could be going on vacation. It doesn't matter. It's personal time off. Um, but at the same time, I just want to put you on spot. How much PTO do you have in the bank? How much do I have right now? Like currently? Yeah. As yeah. of as of today, because you know I check. Because as part of this whole thing, I needed to have this conversation because I knew you were gonna grill me. Um I have <laughs> five weeks. Five weeks. So so like even though you've gotta write it down and and do the PTO thing and you're not allowed to you know, you can't build that to a client, you still have five weeks. Because, because architects don't take time off. Like what, like uh, this is where we're, we're going to have a, well, so a reckoning right now. Well, you know, what's, <laughs> what's interesting about it is so like, you know, the, the, the article, and we'll definitely put a link in the show notes, but the article was really talking about corporate America. And there are mm-hmm. absolutely you no know, tons of parallels between corporate capitalist America and architect, architecture America, <laughs> we could call, you know, what are we going to call it? What yeah, are we going to call right. it? But, it, but I think this is, it's somewhat syst- systemic through architecture period, like global architecture has this mm-hmm. almost demand that if I ask you something, I'm going to go on vacation for a week, but when I come back, I want you to have it, make mm-hmm. sure, or it's just like, oh, oh by the way. I'm taking, you know, a week off while you're taking a week off. Yeah. But when I come back, it'll be there, right? It'll, you know, what I'm asking you to do, that'll probably take about a week's worth of time. It's going to be there. Right. And you're just like, wait, how does that work? work? And there's just this expectation. So you and I have talked so many times about Mm -hmm. boundaries and our lack Mm -hmm. of being able to set them, Mm -hmm. which as we go through this article and we talk about this you know, is the royal us, right? This is the it, royal. This is we. this is definitely the royal us. So so yeah. there was there was a let's see what well, there was one and I've, I've, I do have the article up basically right next to the screen here. It was it was basically talking about. Um, so you're not reading that, email right now. You're oh not, no no you're no, not, no no. You're not I, you're not I'm responding not. to a to a Zoom chat. You're you're okay. I just want to oh, make sure you're that, that's focused. Okay. Yeah. That, that's, that's on the on other this, screen. That's on one of the other that, three that screens. Screen, yeah. Or that screen, but yeah. not this screen. This screen is <laughs> this screen is dedicated to you. So if I ever glance over at those two, I'm not paying attention to you. Yeah. Because yeah. Okay, so I can't. I just want to make sure that you're not multitasking right now and overworking when you're supposed to be doing this. We're Arca speaking. Yes. Well, right. so so they were talking about um, most of us prefer to be too busy and or to not be busy enough. We get a greater sense of our own value when we are working than when we're not. And, you know, I, I think about it. I think we as architects in interest when, cause that first line started to stand out. It's like, we have this vision of an architect who wants to spend time on vacation to get out and experience, you know, like we've been talking about the past few, get out and experience architecture because it kind of enriches our understanding of the built environment and how we go about doing it. But, you know, you and I were talking, you know, we've, we've talked about in the past and stuff that we are so beholden to this kind of like nonstop work that the deadline, the right. deadline that we never really get to that point of basically 
being able to kind of like make ourselves better architects, understanding the built environment better, seeing what else, you know, seeing what other people are doing out there, see experiencing the trends of just like daily life because we're too busy trying to hash out an ASI, you know, or something like that. You know? Right. Well, yeah, it's, it's funny that, that this came also or at the same time as I just finished watching a series on the Disney Plus streaming service called Light and Magic. And it's the story of Industrial Light and Magic, which is a, you know, probably the most famous visual effects house of the entire movie industry. And the, it's basically the story of how that got started, the transition from analog to digital. Uh, and there's a lot of parallels in there to architecture as well. So everything that we look through or we look at, we're looking through the lens of architecture, right? So we're looking at this article through the lens of architecture. This article was not written about architecture. It wasn't written for architects, uh, but it definitely has application. I'm looking at this six part series on Disney plus about ILM also through the lens of architecture and how closely it mirrors working in, I mean, even in school, in studio, mm -hmm. um, the very analog hands-on nature of creating, solving problems, creativity, um, the all-nighter aspect of it, the uh, long hours aspect of it. Like that was our training grounds as architects, right? For right. what we see happening in, in the industry as well. And so you're what you're you're talking about right now it's just like this the there there was a quote in this article immersion in work helps hold off feelings of inadequacy anxiety loneliness sadness and emptiness that can arise when we have time off and it's funny because as you were kind of t talking about the the things that you're doing on this project and you at the end of the day you feel like there's an accomplishment there it's kind of like when i go out and i move a load of firewood because i just had to cut down some dead trees on my it's like, oh man, I feel accomplished. Do you ever feel accomplished after, uh, you know, sitting in a Shea lounge on a beach? Do you feel a sense of accomplishment? And I don't think we do, well, but I also think that's a problem. Right? So it's like, because, because it's hard to, I think the feeling of accomplishment is what leads us to workaholism. Yeah. And it, we like to feel like we accomplished something. And we don't feel that in the balanced part of our life so much, or at least we don't equate it the same way. So, you know, and, and this was the conversation kind of like off camera that you and I were having a little while ago about me feeling like this is an epidemic that is mostly American. Because mm -hmm. you, you talk about, so like in the American culture, and, and I know, you know, from your and I's like very similar backgrounds and just some of the experiences that we've had. And just the, for the fact that we, you know, we're kind of Gen Xers that, you know, we were we are, raised. Yeah. We're not kind we of were, Gen Xers. Yeah, we are. We are Gen Xers. <laughs> just so, but date we, us right there. We were raised that, you know, in a way that to believe that work defines us, that our work ethic de defines us, that we were almost expected to outwork everybody else. And so we always kept working towards defining ourselves by the product of work that we did, whether good work, bad work, whatever. It's just, you know, work, 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 work. We're going to... To the benefit of others, though. I mean, what was in, what's right. interesting to me as you say that, because I totally believe that as well, like the expectation was set and we lived up to it, right? And that was set by our parents. It was set by our teachers. It was set right. by the people that we worked for. And then exploited by the people that we worked for. Right. And it created a culture of, because when you're so focused on this thing, you're also working with other people who are very focused on this thing. Those people tended to marry each other, yeah. like create families together, instill those same work ethics mm -hmm. and other ethics and morals into their offspring who then repeated that process as well. Right. right? And right. so- you can, you can see how we got here, right? Like it was, right. it is programming like the genes of the individuals <laughs> as they go through these experiences exactly. to be the, to be that, to fully embody that. And so we were, I remember having the questions asked, it's just like, oh, do you have a, 
It's like, you know, I'm, you know, such and such son. And, you know, they're like, oh, you know, how are you spending your summer? Do you have a job? You know, it's just like they're, we're expected to be working right. or do you have a job after, you know, after work summer or job, after school internships, you know, yep, yep. all of these things. And, and yes, was typically the answer is like, yeah, I have a summer job. Yeah. I, you know, have a job mm-hmm. after work and all after school and all of these things. And it was just you always busy. Like, exactly. <laughs> you know, are you keeping busy? Are you doing this? You know, are you doing that? And you compare that. And that's, this is why I say that this feels like it's a very, systemic American problem because we were raised to keep busy, keep working, keep you know, idle hands. Push. What's the saying? You know, exactly. Yeah. Idle hands mm-hmm. are the devil's workshop. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. just like, like that's and, a good name for a studio right there. <laughs> exactly. Uh. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hmm. I devil's workshop. Yeah. I like it. Um, and, and, but so then here I am, as an 18 year old, I'm in the army, I'm stationed overseas in Europe, and I see a completely different aspect to the way people live. You know, there are people who they work hard, but they also enjoy hard. They, they have, they have time, they have time off. They close during lunchtime. They really, you know, they, they force themselves to not always be working. I was on a phone call with one of our consultant engineers who happened to be remote working in, I believe it was Denmark and it was five o'clock their time. And so we were sitting here talking and he's just like, guys, 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 sorry, I got to interrupt. I've got, you know, and he, he was like really the only engineer on the call and it was, you know, our team and him. And so essentially it like, shut this meeting down pretty quickly because he was just like they're you know telling us to get out of the bu- you know the building because they're about to close it down the and this building is five closes o- down yeah the the <laughs> you know they're basically saying it's five o'clock work is over get lost mm, yeah you know? right and right and yeah totally but you know there's there's this there is a and in, in we, so we talked about, you know, kind of like these, these cultural aspects, you know, the, the culture in America is to continue to work and to show your worthiness through work. Right. And then that it leaches into our head and it's just like, you know, oh, I feel like such a slug. I really didn't get anything done today or this, that, or the other. And, and so you're just like, you know, we've been programmed to want to work and keep working. And it's just like, okay, I've left work. You know, I, I just commuted an hour home. I'm going to, you know, plug my laptop in. I'm going to get a little bit of food. Then I'm going to come back to my laptop, check in, make sure that there's no emails that came in or if somebody needs mm-hmm. something or things like that. And it's so easy. It's so it's easy. So, we've made it so easy because it's a part of our culture. It's our, you know, it, again, even to this article, it's, it's a, it's almost an expectation that you should be working hard. Why can't I reach you in the middle of the night? Like it's the middle of the night. If you know, right. the only thing you're going to reach is a backhand, you know, yeah, going, going back to those boundaries. And I, and I, the, the thing that came up in the article was uh, guardrails and, yeah. and what you're talking about, even with the building closing, like that's a cultural guardrail that's been yeah. put in place yeah. to protect the, the, the people. Right. And, yeah. and we don't have that. We actually have the opposite of that. We have, right. The notifications, the the always on, you know, dog leash that you have attached to your neck. It sits in your pocket. It's called a phone. And you you talk about if you don't have the right guardrails in place, if you don't have the ability yourself to set the boundaries, then it, what they talk about in the article is that you silently collude with employers who encourage us to overwork. Right. It's not like they're they're saying you must overwork, but you have all of these things that make it easier for you to do that. And they are not going to complain about that, right? Because it's benefiting them. You know, something that just kind of occurred to me about like, you know, not having those guardrails is it has instilled in us a way, this, this kind of sense of like, okay, it's okay if I'm not, you know, a hundred percent productive in the eight hours that I'm within the office, because I'll go and I'll finish up some of that, you know, I'll, yeah, exactly. I can do it anytime. I'll go finish Mm -hmm. that up a little bit later or something like that. Mm -hmm. 
But if you almost had this, the guardrail that limited you from, you know, it's like you, you only really have this eight hours to do your work throughout the day. And when you're done, you're done. You can't do it. But then it gives you this almost sense of like drive to be productive within the eight hours to then be able to have yourself detach from the day to live the life that you are working for, but never experiencing, never being able to have the life that you want. You know, it's just like, well, you know, I, I, you know, I, I work to be able to do this or I work to be able to do that, except for you don't get a chance to do this or that because you're working. Yeah. Yeah. You know? No, you, d- you're encouraged to do that when you retire, like uh, save exactly. all the good stuff for after 65 yeah. or after 72, or whatever the new when you, number is. When you physically can't and go and enjoy you some can't of do those it anymore. things. Exactly. And yeah, you're because just like, you, because your back is out because you've sat at the desk for 50 plus years. Right? One of the things that they were done, one of the things that they pointed out in this article was the almost expectation of like a 12 hour day and how that has a, an impact on your physical well-being, your emotional and mental well-being. And, you know, these are the things that we sacrifice during the work time of our life to then, and then we don't realize that all of that has had such a, this adverse impact on our lives that when we actually get to retirement, we can't fully yeah. enjoy retirement because we're so physically wrecked. We're so mentally say, wrecked. Yeah. You can't yeah. enjoy it until it's too late, and it's too late because you can't do it anymore. Exactly. It, 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 you, 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 sir, w- there you are. You have the double whammy. You're trained as a soldier as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I think like uh, uh, somebody in your situation who has been in combat situations, who's been deployed, who's been trained to follow orders, who's trained to be, and you, I think you've said this yourself, which is, that you are the guy who runs out on the battlefield to save people. You put yourself at risk to save everybody else, whether it's the company, the team, the project, whatever yeah. it is, because it's in your DNA. That's how that's how you're wired. So not only did you do that in architecture school, right, to yeah. the pro- put the project, put the thing, put all of this above yourself, but you also were trained that way as a as a soldier. And so, like I'm, you know, we just talked about guardrails. He- I mean, we could maybe talk about personal guardrails. Have you done anything to put boundaries in place to help you? Because the the inability to regulate work habits, I mean, that's a phrase that they actually talk about in this article. It's it's not like that's what it is. You have a disability to regulate your work habits, right? It's, it's mm-hmm. an inability disability, but it's like, you're, yeah. you're, it's so wired in you. Is there anything that you can speak to that you so, put in place to kind of help yourself as a tool? So we've been doing this for 12 years. We've been, you know, kind of like somewhat bearing our architectural personal soul for 12 years for everybody to hear. I could lie to you and say, oh yeah, sure. Oh, let's just go but, back. Let's, play, let's just rewind. The I was tape. going to say, find it. <laughs> but you know, for you know, for an absolute fact that that is not the case. That you know, there's been times where I would work 85 hours a week. There's times where I would be working because I had reception at a campsite where everybody else is out canoeing, and here I am back at the campfire with the like attached to, you know, my computer attached to my phone. Hot spotting. Exactly. Hot spotting spotting it (laughs) and clicking away, doing stuff and answering things and people. Yay, technology. You Um, know, and and me not allowing myself because it's like, oh, this is so important. Right. I've in in one of the interesting things about the article is it, it talks about how we've come to terms with the excuses that we make in our life to basically not take, not, you know, not take the PTO, not enjoy our time off, you know, detach from, from work. And and I've lived practically every single excuse and and probably have a, a boat ton more of other excuses that I've made with my life. Right. A and metric ton. A metric ton. <laughs> Leaving all of the colorful metaphors off of that, but yes. Yes. And, right. Right. And the, the interesting thing about that is 
we're seeing, and we've, we've had this conversation about the new generation and the new generation who's coming in and they see the way that we were working. They see the way that we had, you know, we're working now, the way that profession has worked in the past and stuff like that. And they look at it and they say, yeah, I don't want that. I don't yeah, want Yeah, it's not this a badge of life. honor in, in any form. We right. used to be proud of the fact, I, sickly enough, <laughs> I used to be proud that I had all of this PTO saved up. What's, where is that badge of honor? Right. You know, I'm not spending the time with my family. I'm not spending time off. I'm not doing what I yeah. said, you know, like enriching my career by going out and experiencing other things. And so there, you know, has been times where I just haven't, I haven't done what I should be doing. And as I start to see these, the new generation come in and we've heard and we've talked about so many different times where, you know, we'll have project managers or something that's like, oh, I just can't get, you know, work like I worked. You know, they don't come in, they don't come in early, they don't stay late. You know, they just, you know, they come in and they do their eight hours and they leave. And I'm thinking to myself, well, that's all we're expecting them to do. That's what their contracts, so that's what the contract they sign with. You know, the contract is 40 hours a week and however they, you know, those 40 hours a week are, if it's come in at nine, they leave at five, they've been efficient enough, boom, they're, they're done. You know, why should we be expecting them? We have spent so much time instilling this weird work ethic in our life, in our profession that makes it feel like an expectation to overwork yourself mm -hmm. and we've carried it as a badge of honors. Like, look at me, you know, how do you expect mm -hmm. to get promoted if you're not going to work, you know, 60, 70, 80 hours a week? Do what I did. Yeah. You, do what you, I did. Right. It's just like the way, the way for you to, you know, ahead in this company is to outwork everybody. Really? Like, you know, why is that? And so you see these, the new generation basically not demanding to live our bad habits and we want to criticize them instead of analyzing ourselves and saying, why aren't we more wanting to do what they want to do? Yeah, I think part of it is just, like when you were you were talking about that that story about why why don't they do this? Why don't they do that? And you hear those complaints. It's like, well, let's just step back and say, is this, are we doing it right? I mean, there, exactly. that self-analysis isn't really happening. No. Right. No. And so and so how do you broach that subject and say, well, have you ever thought about because you don't want to. I shouldn't actually say that. I, I'm just wondering how often that comes up. How often do we actually push back and say, have you thought if this is like still appropriate? Because just because right. it's the way we've always done it doesn't mean it's the way we should continue to do it. And it's interesting, right? Because we're starting to see unionization as an mm -hmm. example, where it's basically coming out of New York City, right? Where there's a lot of unionization in adjacent uh, industries to architecture. Right. Now we're starting to see it in architecture. It's basically saying like the, the, we need boundaries. We need to come together to right. be stronger together to enforce these boundaries and basically say, we're not going to do the, the one-off. If this person's okay with working 80 hours a week, but this person isn't, who's the bad guy there? Right. right. It's, it's right. like, it is interesting to me to see that happen because there are so many long hours for such little pay, yeah. especially for people just getting out of school who want to go work at a firm that has notoriety or interesting projects or whatever. And they're being basically preyed upon by this, the quote unquote leadership of these companies to benefit the most from those long hours and I little sent, pay. I sent this article to a friend of mine who then sent me a, a link to a, an article that was written by psychologists about this, you know, this kind of like attachment syndrome and how, you know, we're defined like this, proving your worthiness, proving your worth through your work and all of this other stuff. And she had kind of commented back about, she was like, well, she's like, all of this sounds like you. And she's like, you know, you, she's like, to me, this is your identity. This, you know, like your passion is your identity, but your identity is your work and all of these things. And, you know, I, I started to look at it and it was just like this, I, I've felt like I've done myself such a disservice by 
you know, it goes back to, let me just, you know, like take, it goes back to this conversation about boundaries. It goes back to this conversation about the reality of the way that we approach our clients, the way that we set up our projects, the way that we staff projects and things like that. I mean, we don't exactly get highest fees. We don't get a lot. We do, but you know, <laughs> like we do, and, and you just said this architecture is hard. You know, it's like we manage the projects, we manage the clients, we manage the engineers, we manage all of these different things. We do all of the design work. We do all of this coordination. We do all of this stuff. And if you look at our fee per the level of responsibility to everybody else, ours is usually like, you know, at the bottom. It's it's paltry. Yeah. And so, you know, when we're, when we're doing, when we set it up like that, and then of course, then we say, okay, well, the only way that we're going to be able to really be profitable on this project is that we need to limit the either amount of billable hours on this project. We need to amount billable staff on this project. However, it is that the makeup is that makes it, makes us rationalize being profitable on this project is basically reducing the amount of time that we spend on it. And we, we, we ultimately do the project a disservice by trying to limit the amount of time we spend on a project rather yeah. than saying, Hey, we know that this project is actually going to demand X amount of time and all of this other stuff. Then we're in this catch 22. It's just like, okay, yeah, we know the reality of how long it's going to take to do the project, but you know, Cormac's competing for this project and now Evan comes in and he's competing for this project too. And he says, I can do it for the same amount of money, but I can do it for less time. And you're just like, uh, uh, and then, you know, and you know that, no, you really can't. But mm -hmm. you're going to figure out a way to you're either sweep those hours under the rug. You're going to sweep those hours under the rug. You're going to push your people mm -hmm. to work harder. You're going to overwork them. You're going to demand things from them. And then you get to the point where it's just like, okay, the right thing to do would be is to, you know, maybe compensate them for their overworking and stuff. It's just like, but we just Here's a barely... pizza. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that... Damn it. You beat me to it. I was just like, hey, we're <laughs> going to have a pizza party. You're like, pizzas are not a bonus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it, it's, we, we've, we have set up and we've talked about this in the past about how bad architects are at the business side of things because we never are truthful with ourselves on how long it takes. And if we're not truthful with ourselves, we can't be truthful with our clients. And if we can't convince our clients of the truth, of how long it takes us to do these projects, we're always going to be working in a deficit. Yes. Yet we still keep doing it to ourselves. Okay. So, so the interesting thing about that to me is something that they also stated in this article and I'm, let's see it. Oh, here it is. It's a um, workaholism is a form of self <laughs> anesthetizing. Yeah. And so basically it's like, we're, we're doing this so that we don't focus, we don't have to focus mm -hmm. on change. We don't have to focus on right. actually stepping back and looking at the big picture of the pros and cons and the detrimental effects of the things that we are doing because we're just so busy in quotes doing these things, right? It's like, yep. well, look at, look at this checklist. Look at all this stuff I've got to do. I've got to do all this. I've got to do it. I've got to do all these things on my checklist. Yep. What what we're really saying is like, don't look right over there at the elephant in the room, right? Don't look at it because if you just keep busy on this checklist right here, you don't have to look at yourself. You don't have to look right. at your business. You don't have to look at your fees. You don't have to look at your processes. You don't have to look at your technology. You don't have to look at any of that stuff because you're just so busy working hard, over right. here. Right. Exactly. And, and it really is like a, it's a, it's a lack of reflection on all of those other things because that's scary stuff. And so really it's fear. Like this workaholism is based on fear of looking over there at the elephant in the room because right. change is hard. Right. And I might actually figure out that I've been super ineffective 
I might actually validate my deepest fears that, that I am completely ineffectual in these five areas when the perception that I want people to have of me is that I'm a really hard worker and look yeah. at all these things that I've accomplished. Yeah. And while you're working and you've got your head down and your blinders on, you see the perception of that elephant just it's right there off it's in the right distance. There. Just right there. And you there. know you know that the answer to a lot of the problems, self induced problems, is to face that, but you never do. Because you feel so it's like we have these conversations about, and because you just kind of like gave a list of, so it's like, oh, you know, we'd be more efficient if we had, you know, the right experience on a job or, you know, if we had, you know, better equipment to be, you know, run more efficiently. So we're not like slowed down by, you know, Revit taking, you know, two hours to open or an hour to synchronize or all of these other things. If we were just faster at being able to do all these things, we could, you know, work more efficiently. You know, we never say, okay, we can work more efficiently. But then does that efficiency reduce the amount of time that we should actually be no, working? No, it just no. gives you more time to put more shit in the project. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, that's that's been the case forever. I mean, the, the, the whole idea of building information modeling was like the drawings get produced for you. You build the model. Look at the drawings. They magically appear. And what do we do? We just put more shit in those drawings. Like, yeah. <laughs> we keep yeah. talking about the size of the set of drawings <laughs> and it's like you 2000 sheets in right to this thing. And it's like, do you really need all that? I mean, is this right? We don't, there are no, again, there are no guardrails for any of this stuff. And so right. I come back to the question, like, have you put any guardrails in place? Like one of the simple ones, and we talked about this on an episode, we talked about focus modes on the iPhone. Mm -hmm. I have a focus mode at night called sleep. Guess what sleep does? It basically puts my phone into do not disturb so that nothing can right. come through until 7 a.m. the next day, right? From 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. My Wi-Fi at night shuts off in my house. I have it sh on a timer. You that The Wi-Fi is gone, right? So will the cell signal still work? Yes, it'll still work, but the Wi-Fi shuts off. And it's like little things like that. Like no one's going to do that for you. You have to do it. You right, have to right. create those boundaries and then you have to live by them. If you don't do it, no one else will do it for you. And they will take advantage of you by not having those things in place, in fact. Right. So it's like, I don't know. I think there is hope and there's ways you can accomplish some of this, even with technology. There's some of it you can accomplish with your words by saying no to people. Right. 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 Exactly. Um, but there are, there are things that can be done. I would be interested to hear what people have done to put boundaries in place, whether it's technology. I don't know what those things could be. I, I, I expect people could blow my mind with, with really simple techniques, but I'd be interested to hear what those are. I, I had a friend who, and you, you say that, and that's interesting because, so there's the personal boundaries that we can set, right? But then what about the corporate boundaries? What about... Yeah, there's cultural. You know, yes, yeah, yes, exactly. yes. Because, you know, I, I have a friend who recently took a job at a firm and he was telling me that they actually have means to track the efficiency of a project that actually has automated indicators of, you know, kind of like this either like increase in like work demand load. I, I, I'm not, I'm not quite clear on exactly what it is, but basically it's, it's saying it's like, okay, Evan, if you're working so much and you're billing all of these hours and stuff, you know, it's an mm -hmm. indicator to me that we need to mm -hmm. get you help. We need to get you support. And it's not yeah. something that is just right. like, Evan, you didn't, you never told us, you never raised the red flag yeah. because you're right. so hyper-focused on getting it done that there isn't a mm -hmm. time for you to stop and take a breath. And like raise yes. your hand and say, please help me. You know, yeah, there there's a, there's a technology called BIM beats and I've had these guys on my other podcast talking about it and it's like, they met, they put metrics to everything. So basically they can track and this sounds creepy, corporate creepy. Mm -hmm. They can track how long you're working in Revit, how long you're working in Rhino, how much time you're putting in on these different applications, how much outlook mm -hmm. is open, whatever those things are. There's a lot of different metrics that could be applied. 
And employees are thinking like, oh my God, they're going to see like how ineffective I am. And, and actually the story is, <laughs> no, you're working too much. I can see it right here. I can actually see that you're putting eight hours on your time card, but you're spending 12 hours a day syncing right. to central and, and doing all these things. Is it a technology issue? Do you need more training? Do you need boundaries? Do we need to help you in some way? Right. Those those are ways that that the company could actually help by knowing a little bit more about the work habits of people. And at the yeah. same time, there is a there is kind of a, a privacy issue there, or you know, a perceived privacy issue there. So I'm not yeah, saying because, one way or the other because it is nuanced. You got to have the right intentions. Yeah, because I will probably say that it will be a perceived. It's just like, oh well, they don't trust me to do my work. And mm -hmm. so this is a way for them to track, you know, whether or not I'm efficient, inefficient, whatever it is that, and so, you know, I, I do definitely see like the catch 22 of all of this, but you know, there are, you know, it's just like, if the culture doesn't exist for you to throw up that red flag and say, holy crap, I'm drowning. Can you please, I need help. I need right. help then, you know, what, where is it? Where does the responsibility lie? in being able to have kind of like this joint flag throwing, I guess, whatever you want to call it. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. This, if you can't raise the flag, will someone raise it for you kind of right. thing, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, I'll say that, you know, when I was doing those ungodly hours, I mean, it was just, okay. The, the joke was, is, you know, Cormac, you put, uh, in fact, I, this was an exact, almost an exact quote. Cormac, you only put a uh, 60 hours on your timesheet. Did you, you know, were you on vacation? Mm. <laughs> you know, and you're just like, uh, that hurts. That it hurts. does hurt. And it, and it points out, it's just like, okay, nobody, like the only way, like nobody's like saying, holy shit, you're working 85 hours. They're saying, oh, oh you're not working as hard as you normally are. What's wrong with you? Well, and you set that expectation, uh, some for and I some head, it. like exactly inadvertently. I mean, you didn't realize that it was going to hurt you later, but it kind of did. Right. I mean, right. And so, so like this idea of finding your value in work, how do you start to reassess your values to, I mean, to me, that's, that's the bigger question, right? How do we reflect on our behavior our output, where our values are, wh what those list of values are. I mean, it's like at some point you actually have to go sit in a silent room with no devices and think about it. And I think yeah. that's part of that fear that I was talking about earlier. It's like the elephants in the room, man, yeah. you, you actually have to look at it at some point. The industry, the profession has to look at itself. We've had so many of these conversations. Like I'm even thinking of the one we had with Evelyn. Lee on this podcast about redesigning our business models, redesigning our practices, because the current model doesn't work. How long is it going to be until we do that, even on a personal level? Do we we have to step back and, and reflect and say, is this where I want to be? Is this where I thought I would be? Is this what I want to be known for? Is this where I actually find my value? How can you start to build a new framework to evolve, right? Like, because things are always changing. If you're, if you're resistant to that, you're going to die right at some point. Right. And you're going right. to, you're going to be obsolete if, if you're not going to die. But it's like th those kinds of things I think are the things we really have to think about. And I hope that this conversation kind of sparks that in people to say, okay, we took a real deep breath at the beginning of this podcast, right? How can right. we actually do that personally and say, oh, I need to reevaluate. I really need to reevaluate because y you are, are the one who has to do that. Again, no one is going to do that for you. They're interested in themselves or they're interested in some other motivator, right? That's that, that they have. And so that's not you, right? They're not going to do it, come in and save the day for you. There's, there's no right. Prince right. Charming that's going to come in and wake you up, right? With a kiss, <laughs> you've got to, you've got to wake yourself up. Maybe this episode yeah. will do that. Maybe this episode's the Prince Charming. I don't know. But it's like uh, that. That's what we have to do. And I, I mean, I, I, because I, I hear these stories. We, we had Jake Rudin out of architecture on a podcast, mm -hmm. right? We put a link to that episode in the show notes. 
they have a whole business, a consulting business called Out of Architecture right. for this very reason, because we have the blinders on so tight. Like it's just such a narrow field of view that we have to look outside of that and say, how, how, I mean, he's actually how helping can, people get out. He's, he's like, <laughs> pe people are asking themselves, how can I regain myself? Yes. And he's yeah. like, because, because my profession is not, my, my profession is not you. set up to do it for my corporate culture is not set up to do that for me. I am kind of stuck in this whirlwind where I'm, I have to, you know, if, do I want to keep my job? So I'll just keep like feeding the machine, feeding the machine. And then, you know, you get to this point where it's just like burnout to a point of almost, you know, your own personal self non-existence that then you, you know, go, you have to like go and knock on like Jake's door and say, yes, yeah, like I need help. Like I, mm -hmm. like I, I, I I'm in, a, you need therapy. I'm in an yeah. abusive relationship. Help me. Mm -hmm. And so, it's, and we said, we even said it with, um, you know, when we were talking to Jake, it's just like, we court, you know, like the profession needs to look at the existence of companies like this companies like out of architecture to say, what are we doing wrong? What, do we need to do? Why to does that need to exist? Exactly. It's just like, why, why is that know? even a thing? Exactly. Why exactly. is out of architecture a thing? Exactly. Oh my gosh. And so, but, yeah. but it's a thing. And if you, if you go through and you look at the testimonials of all of the people in the complaints, you read the book, you know, cause we had you know kind of started the whole conversation with him about the book itself and, and read the book and read all of these different testimonies about the way that the culture basically chews you up and spits you out and doesn't care that mm -hmm. that's when you have to, does it start at, in a way I was thinking as you were talking, it was like, in a way it does start at the personal level. It's like, go into that dark room, take those deep breaths, you know, listen to the silence, start thinking to yourself, what is important to you? And if you're passionate enough about it, go to, you know, like start taking the next steps of like how to figure out how to change the, the baby steps of like, you know, maybe the company and then maybe, you know, the profession and stuff like that. It, it, or <laughs> knock on, you know, knock on the old uh, Jake's door and say this, it's, it's just not, but I mean, I think we can only, we can only get change if we demand change. And Be if the change. Exactly. Damn it, you beat me to it. Yeah, I was just like, and, and the only way we could do that is to be the change. There, that's what I was saying. Uh, you can cut my part out. You can take that one. No, no, no. I like it. I like it. Because, you, you know, because. Oh. Yeah. yeah. So let's, uh, let's all go into a dark room. Mm -hmm. Totally quiet. Take deep cleansing breaths. Cormac will now lead us in this meditation. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Uh, om. <laughs> Do your ohms. Uh, I'll be meditating until the next time we talk. Exactly. With a new epiphany right around the corner. I know it's coming because I'm, I'm going to ask, ask the universe for that new epiphany. It, it will deliver. You may not like what you have, what it has to say, but be that cosmic out there. dope slap to the head. Yes, indeed. All right. Good luck. <laughs>